We're fighting for our dignity, for our citizenship, full citizenship rights now. So you're looking at this really contested terrain and in the middle of this contested terrain, you have African Americans who refuse to go into their place, who refuse to just stand there and take it and who refuse to just abide by the old ways because they're like, no, this is a new day. This program is brought to you by Emory University. Tulsa, the Af African-American community in Tulsa was relatively prosperous, well-educated. I mean, they had done everything that they were supposed to do in terms of the American dream. You work hard, you save your money, you go to school, you buy property. I mean, this is, and this is what they had done under horrific conditions. I mean, when you look at the context of what black, black uh, America looked like at the time, the fact that they were able to do this, this is one of the things that we herald in terms of when we talk about the immigrant story, right? But instead, this created such seething resentment in Tulsa that you had black doctors, black attorneys, black businessmen. I mean, in fact, this area of Tulsa was known as Black Wall Street to give you some sense of how much it held in terms of value, in terms of esteem, in terms of, of worth. And, but that resentment in Tulsa was so intense and that it was just waiting for a, a, a spark to just ignite it. That spark was a black messenger was delivering a message, you know, they had messengers back in the day, was delivering a message downtown. And he gets in the elevator and there's a white woman in the elevator. I believe she was the elevator operator. And from the first floor through the third floor, I mean, the elevator may have bumped or something and he, 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 he hit her a little bit, but he didn't hit her, he just kind of brushed him against her. She yelled, rape. Now to understand what the charge of rape means when a white woman yells rape against a black man in this period, because part of understanding the violence that African Americans faced was to deal with the issue of what was called the sanctity of white womanhood. And that sanctity of white womanhood said that all white women had to be protected from black beast, so-called black beast. And when she yelled rape, now the charge was absolutely improbable from the first floor through the, to the third floor, improbable. But it was the spark. They couldn't wait because he was the son of a prominent black businessman. So they hauled him, the police hauled him down to the station. Well, the black elite came down to the station going, you know, this is my son. This is my boy. Uh-uh, uh-uh. My son wouldn't do this. What's his bail? And I'm like, oh, uppity. How, how dare you come down here? How dare you? And because the African-American community sensed that the, the sense of anger and violence was rising, it wasn't one or two that came down. There were several of them that came down. And like, oh, so what, are you going to storm the, the jail? They said, no, but we're here for justice. We're here for justice. And then the lynch mob began to form in Tulsa. It was like, oh, these are some uppity Negroes who need to be put back in their place. And the violence began. Black Tulsa was, the lynch mob rode in, but they also came in airplanes, dropping bombs on Tulsa, Black Tulsa. There are de descriptions and depictions of African Americans being decapitated, being forced to kneel down and just having their heads severed. There are the pictures of the strafings, of the bombings, of the shootings. Nobody's quite sure what the death toll is. But when you look at the pictures, what you see is an area that had once been thriving. What we say is the American dream, absolutely leveled by the violence, by the lynch mobs, by the airplanes, by the bombs, leveled. Black Tulsa has never recovered. As the bombings are happening, as the violence is happening, as Tulsa is on fire, the governor of Oklahoma is like, whoa, maybe, mmm, I probably should. The feds are looking up going, this is not our issue. I bet you, wow. 
nothing we can do here. And that is so indicative of the imbalance that has happened in terms of justice, in terms of rights, in terms of the protection of basic civil and human rights for African Americans in the United States. Would you like to increase your customer base, grow your online presence, transform the look of your brand? Let the marketing experts at Logo Graphics Design and Advertising help you hit the mark. Logo Graphics has provided marketing solutions for businesses for over 26 years. Our services include website development, marketing flyers or banners, email marketing, nonprofit outreach, social media management, and more. Contact our office to turn your ideas into solutions today. Call us at 1 800 288 9524 or email us at logographicsdna at gmail.com. Hi, my name is Phyllis O'Hara, CEO and founder of Angelo's Jewelry. This spring and summer, I will be bringing to you the Bold and the Beautiful Collection, consisting of sparkling three-piece necklace sets. Get bold and be beautiful. Don't miss our Jewelry Workshop Series each weekend, teaching girls from age 6 to 18 how to express themselves by designing and creating their own unique pieces. Contact us today to register for upcoming workshops or inquire about a special gift at 314-477-3036 by email phyllisohara91 at gmail.com and on Facebook at Angelo's Jewelry. Have you ever been pressed for time, rushing to get to that very important meeting with the big guys, or trying to beat that grace period at work and finding somewhere to park is nearly impossible? You finally find a parking spot in front of the parking meter and you realize that you didn't bring any change. You happen to look over and see a homeless man sitting on the sidewalk. And for a half second, we immediately assume that the homeless person wants something from us. We snap back to reality as we check all our pockets for change because we don't want to get a parking ticket. Coincidentally, we look over and see the homeless man handing us the exact change we need for the parking meter. My new album, View From The Inside Out, was created to encourage listeners to not judge a book by its cover because sometimes it's the person that we least expect that will be the one that gives us exactly what we need when we need it. View from the Inside Out drops March 19 everywhere. And remember, integrity matters the most when you're by yourself. Hey, I bring to you DOC, Disciples of Christ Ministries. We are dedicated to the advancement of God's kingdom by bringing our people closer to Christ. We are proving ways to effectively commit scripture to memory. If you want to memorize biblical text but are not sure what to memorize or how, the SOAP study is perfect for you. The SOAP method, scripture, observation, application, prayer, is the perfect launching point to begin hiding God's word in your heart. This user-friendly and godly inspired gift will give you thought starters to encourage you and others on your spiritual journey, bringing you intrinsic, extrinsic, and most importantly, eternal value. For more information, you may contact us today at 314-449-1337. Receive a free Bible with your order today. The Dynasty Media Portal is a media distribution platform reflecting multiple genres of music, film, and special events via radio, television, and online streaming. Advertisers and content generators are connected to a combined listening audience of over 14 million viewers with any single piece of content. It's unlimited access for your organization or business through digital and social media marketing. Contact us at 1-800-288-9524 or email us at dynastytelevision at gmail.com. Visit www.dynastytelevisionmediaportal.com and experience what it means to be destined for Dynasty. Claude Neal was the last spectacle lynching in the United States. 
Now, I know spectacle and lynching are words that really should not go together, but they did. What happened in 1934 was that Claude Neal was in a jail in Alabama. The lynch mob was incensed. They didn't want him going through the regular judicial system. Now understand that the regular judicial system in Alabama for African Americans was not a kind and gentle force. But a lesson needed to be made of Claude. And that lesson was going to be one of the most horrific acts of violence on American soil. Part of what you had with spectacle lynching was that I know we have these ideas in our head about a lynching where they're one guy, two guys, mm -mm. they sold tickets. This was advertised in the churches. Special trains were in fact reserved where you could get the special train ticket. It's almost, almost like a cruise line kind of deal. I mean, it, 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 it was a festival, it was an event. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I don't need an event where it's advertised, announced in church on Sunday. So, you know, we've got uh, minister so-and-so -so is going to be speaking here and so-and-so is going to be having there. And oh, by the way, we're going to have a lynching down in Florida. Uh, we've got, you can get your special tickets in the back. They only cost so much. And it's going to, you know, bring your kids, bring a picnic basket. It's going to be fabulous. Claude Neal gets yanked out of that jail in Alabama. He gets sent through a gauntlet of torture down into Florida where the, the crowd that has bought their tickets and come in on their special trains and bought, brought their picnic baskets are waiting for this incredible event. He is put up on a stand, stripped naked, and the crowd is going wild. He's being branded. I mean, you, you already see the blood. I mean, because he's gone through this gauntlet of torture. And then they began to just start cutting off his body parts. Part of the torture is they begin to cut off his genitalia. They cut off one piece, stuff it in his mouth, and force him to eat it. And the crowd is like, yeah! And they cut off some more of his genitalia, stuff that in his mouth. And he did. So you can imagine this man is standing there before the throng, bleeding, forced to eat his own flesh. And there is no sense of humanity anywhere in the air. Then they start cutting off his fingers and throwing them to the crowd like a souvenir. And the crowd is like, more, 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 more. And Claude is there bleeding to death, being branded with hot irons, and finally, after no more, then strung up. This is the spectacle lynching of Claude Neal. That was horrific enough. But what, in fact, makes it beyond egregious is then the response of the law enforcement officials. The NAACP immediately sent folks down to investigate this lynching. They went to Alabama and they said, mm, Alabama, there's no crime committed here because he wasn't killed here. So they went to the officials in Florida. Florida said, he's not from here. No crime committed because he's not from here. Now, I didn't realize that anywhere in the statute dealing with murder, it said you had to be from that space in order for that to be a murder. But the NAACP thought, hmm. We now have on the books the Lindbergh kidnapping law, based on the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh's baby, that therefore makes it a crime, a federal crime, to, to take somebody and transport them against their will across state lines. So the NAACP goes to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover says, no crime committed here because nobody asked for a ransom. That is what justice looked like for Claude Neal and so for so many African Americans during the Great Depression.
wow, I'm a lucky man. She is the light of my life and as fine as a Georgia pine. Good God from Zion. She's truly been a blessing. So what am I afraid of? I mean, she's perfect in every way. I love her. Yeah, I need to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing. Yeah, it's time. My man is fine. He even looks better in the morning. Mm, mm, mm. I love him so much. Although he's not perfect, I accept him for who he is. And I'll support him in every area. I'll be there for him till death do us part. Hi, I'm Roz McCarthy, CEO founder of Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Minorities for Medical Marijuana is a nonprofit advocacy, outreach, and education organization based in Orlando, Florida. Our focus is making sure that minorities have an opportunity in the new legalization of marijuana throughout the country. We're in South Carolina, we're in Missouri, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Texas. Arizona. Our organization was formed to make sure that individuals, people of color, people uh, um, coming from communities of color have an opportunity to be able to participate in the legalization of cannabis in the United States. One of the most interesting, crazy, incredible cases of American jurisprudence deals with Scottsboro. Again, you can't understand unless you've got the context of the Great Depression. You have folks riding the rails looking for work just because they can't afford to, you know, I'll go find this job here. So they're just hopping on a train and riding in trying to find work wherever they can find work. Well, what happens at, in the Scottsboro case is you have nine black teenagers and some of them get in a fight on the train with a couple of white guys. The train stops in Scottsboro, you know, because this fight has broken out. As they're getting off the train, as the sheriff's folks are there, the white guys get off, the black guys get off, and then two white women get off. And the townsfolk are looking around going, oh. And the white women, because you've got black guys and white women in Alabama in the early 1930s, I believe 1932. It's like, whoa. And the women, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates, yell rape. And say that these nine black teenagers raped them. The town immediately whoo, took the nine kids hauled them in jail. There was a one-day trial for these nine kids that ranged from the age of like 12 or 13 to 17, known as the Scottsboro Boys. In this trial, Victoria Price described a, a horrific rape. Well, the problem was, was that the doctor who had examined these women said, mm, there's no evidence of rape here. But that didn't stop the jury. The, the doctor now didn't testify that there was no evidence of rape. But it was very clear that he knew there was no evidence of rape. And he had told folks there was no evidence of rape. 
These nine black teenagers were convicted and rape was an executable offense in the 1930s. And so in a one day trial, eight of them were sentenced to die in the electric chair. The youngest was sentenced to life imprisonment in an Alabama prison. Now, there are multiple problems with that story. One, Ruby Bates, one of the women who had yelled rape, recanted, said it didn't happen. Now let me tell you what really happened here. We're prostitutes. And the Mann Act, the Federal Mann Act, says that we were afraid of getting, because you can't cross state lines for immoral purposes. And since we crossed over uh, out of Tennessee and Alabama, we were afraid that we might get brought up on federal charges. So we were just trying to protect ourselves. And so we just said, mm, rape. Another part of the problem was that first the, the Communist Party's legal wing hopped in there and took this case up to the Supreme Court to try to protect the Scottsboro Boys. Then the NAACP hopped in it. But one of the major Supreme Court decision was the Powell v. Alabama decision that came after this. Because think about this. You're on trial for your very life, for a crime that never happened. Your court appointed attorneys, one is the town drunk. I believe at the time he may have had a blood alcohol level of 0.2. I mean, lit. The other attorney in a capital case is probably in about the fourth stages of senility. So one of your attorneys is senile, looking for butterflies, and the other one is drunk, seeing butterflies. Now, the Supreme Court, even the Supreme Court in the 1930s went, really? No, come on. <laughs> You, come on, this is just too much even for us. And they remanded the case, they kicked the case back down, Alan, you gotta try these fellas again. Well, what happens now that they've got a real legal team is that they began to construct the train and found out that many of the Scottsboro boys weren't even on the, in the same car as the women. So how can a rape happen? If the guys aren't in that car, they were convicted once again. Case goes back up to the Supreme Court. By the time there, there were so many egregious constitutional errors in this case, that by the time the Scottsboro case is done, and eventually they start getting let out one by one by one by one, it took First, 18 years for the last one. Imagine being in prison, in an Alabama prison. You are 17. You get out when you're 35 for a crime that never happened. A crime where one of the women has recanted. A crime where the evidence demonstrates that it, you, you couldn't have done this thing. This would be called mm, an egregious wrong. You also had several who had escaped. Imagine trying to escape from an Alabama chain gang, but they managed to get out. Michigan refused. They, the Alabama tracked one down up into Michigan. Michigan refused, and think about this, a state refusing to extradite a convicted felon back to Alabama, because Michigan looked up and said, shh, this is wrong. This is just wrong. The last one was pardoned by Governor George Wallace sometime, I believe, in the 1980s. So imagine again, basically living in the shadows for almost 40, 50 years because of something that never happened, the charge of rape. I mean, Scottsboro speaks to so much in the criminal justice system. But what you also get in this is a series of Supreme Court decisions dealing with the right to competent counsel, thank God, and the, the right to have a jury that is really truly a jury of your peers. Now, that is some amazing, amazing jurisprudence that is coming out of this case of horrific, egregious um, 
unjust, justifiable. I, I have no more words for what happened at Scottsboro, um, but an egregious wrong that in my eyes has never been righted.